Tivoli Room at the Throckmorton Theater. I'd like to introduce Mr. Mort Saul. <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm really surprised to see you because, uh, uh, you know, this weekend, all these cars were on one on one leaving this morning. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a celebration of our, our exit from the European Union. <laughs> anyway, uh, the only living heart donor in our country, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't mind if I sit down for a while. I'll get up later. I, uh, I had a temporary illness, and uh, I moved up with Marine General, and I, I lost a lot of weight uh, to a point where the hearing aids were slipping out. <laughs> I got a uh, letter today, an email from Woody Allen and Dick Cavett urging me to stop Trump. <laughs> you know, liberals have been at it so long, they've forgotten they've become reactionaries. That's it, you know. Uh, Cavett wants to be with the A group, you know. I know him a long time, you know. I got him a job with uh, Merv Griffin, the writer, and I got him on the Jerry Lewis show. And, which used to be on ABC, which I was on. And uh, after the first show, Jerry Lewis threw this big party at the Beverly Hill Black Tie. And uh, I took Yvonne Craig, Batgirl, and Cabot Sutton's. And uh, they put the show up on a big screen and put the lights up in the dining room. and. They brought in uh, baked Alaska for dessert. <laughs> and as Cavett was eating these strawberries and everything, he kept looking at the screen to see if any of his jokes were in there. And it was the monologue. And he looked for a napkin because of the strawberries and all. And he took these white gloves that he wanted and wore in his party. Wipe off the strawberry juice. So, uh, I'll tell you the joke he wrote for me. He said, uh, uh, Mort Saul does jokes for people who read newspapers, and Jerry Lewis does jokes for people that deliver newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, he took her gloves. And, uh, and I had him in a hungry eye, you know, with the blue blazer and everything. Uh, before we get started tonight, I should tell you. A great story. Cabin has a house in Montauk at the end of Long Island. And uh, when I was a writer, I worked for Paul Newman, and he made a movie called Pocket Money. And the studio said, has to be two stars. You can have Tony Curtis in it, but it's got to be two stars. You have Redford in it. They couldn't get anybody like that. So they got Lee Marvin. And uh, Marvin made the picture, and afterwards he said, you have to go out and sell it, because Newman won't do television. Where am I going? You're going on a Dick Cabot show in New York. So I go to Cabot and I say, uh, we'd like you to see the picture so you can discuss it and plug it with Lee Marvin. So Cabot said, well, I live in Montauk. You'll have to bring it there and open the theater, 150 miles out there, and it's snowing in New York. So they get a limousine, Warner Brothers, and they send the picture out there. And uh, Cabot goes, it doesn't go. That's what happened. He didn't go. They run in the theater, and nobody's there. And nobody's there to go into the theater because it's snowing, like 12 feet of snow, <laughs> and mom talk. Now we go to do the show, and uh, Marvin knows that Cabot didn't go. So he goes on the show, and uh, Dick Cabot says to him, uh, tell me about the picture. What's the picture about? He said, I don't know what they're about. I know the check didn't bounce. <laughs> and I did the picture. And I hit my lines and said my marks. But I never know what they're about, and I don't care. 
So I counted this to him. You're not really a leading man. You always play a villain. How does it feel to go out there and know that everybody in the audience automatically hates you? And Lee Marvin said to him, I thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> one, one time I did the cabbage show there with Bob Hope. And Kevin said to him, every one of us who tries to be funny owes a debt to you. And uh, uh, Hope came off and he was in the wings and he said to me, I feel like I ought to be a statue in a park. <laughs> Could you come by and, you know, get what the vision has left? Oh, my <laughs> God. So, a good guy, you know. Uh, big Republican, great friend of Nixon. And he said, uh, when Martin Luther King met with Lyndon Johnson, Hope said to me, they met for three hours, and uh, Johnson made a compromise that was going to make him a cardinal, and that way he only have to kiss his ring. <laughs> the Republican. They never did get laughs, so it's okay. <laughs> Very loyal. <laughs> loyal to Dick Nixon right to the end. Hope, Hope and Crosby split over Kennedy. Cro they're both Republicans, but uh, Crosby was an Irish Catholic and he wanted to go with Jack Kennedy. And Hope was straight ahead. Nixon, Republican, and they split. I'll tell you what split over the Kennedy uh, Nixon election. Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, I made a movie with Sidney Poitier called uh, All the Young Men with Alan Black. And, uh, we're Marines in Korea. And uh, Poitier, uh, oh, this guy gets wounded. He needs a blood transfusion. And the only guy that's his blood type is the black guy. And he's a bigot. Classic drama. <laughs> We watch the black blood flowing in a white cat. <laughs> <Time. laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the reason nobody's in the Sequoia tonight. Because the movies are like that. So uh, I uh, I did a lot of those war movies. You know? First movie I made was called The Law and War with Robert Wagner. And uh, Deathless Dialogue. I'm in this foxhole, and the telephone rings, and I say, good morning, World War II. <laughs> <laughs> now, a guy that has enough talent to make more funny. That's the kind of guy that the Republican Party needs. The Democratic Party knows how to make it funny already. But uh, you notice today that uh, Clinton won in, the, in Phoenix, and the plane next to him, by coincidence, was that of the Attorney General, who happens to have the key to Hillary's cell for the emails. And, but the Attorney General can't be corrupt because she's black, fellow liberals. And uh, oh, boys, are they hokey. The liberals are really hokey. And, uh, and Nobody says to me they're liberals, but they keep, uh, you know, I catch them in prayer that Trump will never be like the, a fate worse than death. And Elizabeth Warren the other day said, that money-grubbing Donald Trump, because you know nobody's interested in money except Republicans, <laughs> did you man Rose? Uh, in oh. and, uh, and then she pointed out that she's part Cherokee which makes them all the more inviting to vote for her. I noticed those cheap bones. I think there's something about her. Maybe I, I'll try and sell her a rifle to a trapper. So, <laughs> do you remember uh, the searchers with John Wayne? How he talks about the Indians? Good movie. Uh, Clint Eastwood is a new movie coming. Very exciting. Uh, with Tom Hanks as Captain Saltberger. Remember that flight? Sullivan. Fasten your seat belts, fasten them again. We're going into the Hudson River. So, anything but give a refund. So, 
So God made that picture. And uh, even though I know the ending, I'm still going. <laughs> my expectations. And you know, I sold my first movie to Clint when I was a writer. And uh, I sold the, the first movie to him. It was about a guy who was getting divorced, making the great adjustment. He leaves his wife, who's bitter and drunk and materialistic. And he says, where can I meet the girl? So he moves to the marina in Los Angeles. And he meets the stewardess there. And uh, he talks to her about his dream of life and everything. She said, you're not realistic. And he finally has enough of it. And he picks her up and throws her into the water at the end of the pier. And even you know, the sheriff has a, a radio station down there if you're ever in trouble. And he goes to the guy on the radio and he says, there's somebody drowning out there if you're interested. And he said to me, what is that supposed to mean? I said, that America is drowning. That's what the picture's supposed to mean. You, you know, you're in a lot of trouble when the guy that pays you and is the star of the picture wants to know what it's about. <laughs> So uh, I never did, he never did make it, uh, but then we kept selling. We sold it to Redford, and he didn't make it. We kept selling it, so. And along the way, uh, the president of MGM won. And uh, when I got over to MGM, there were three guys in his office yelling because they wanted to do a remake of Robin Hood, three of them. And I walked in the office and said, why is everyone yelling? And the boss said, there's a traffic jam in Sherwood Forest. <laughs> really knocked me out. So uh, that was a funny business to be in, you know. I had a, a way into that, you know, I had known Eastwood because we used to go to see Stan Kenton's orchestra together. And he'd hit on a cocktail waitresses in between numbers. <laughs> That's what we used to do. So you're more advanced now, you know, you're looking at your phone and all. We didn't have any of this in those days. So, uh, <laughs> and you, you, know, you notice there's a preeminent theme in this work is that what's important is not money, it's love. I can't remember what I was preoccupied with that. And when I used to write, you know, I bring the scripts in, and whether it was Clint or Redford or Don Johnson, they'd go right through it. And I'd say, what are you looking for? And they'd say, I want to see who gets the girl. <laughs> so that is symbolic in this country. In other words, is some guy who is only, can only evaluate her physically for the moment going to exploit the girl and throw her out before the sun comes up? Or is somebody going to come along and get a lover? Why is that important? Because the girl is American. That's why this election is important. They're all important, but this one especially, you know. And uh, and the liberals have got to retrain themselves. But I don't know anything more important than romance. I know that's a shock to all of you. You all thought I was interested in politics. <laughs> About far, you know, bite your tongue. Far from it. Uh, in other words, when I look, when I look at this thing, you know, and I look at Hillary Clinton talking about the future, which is a contradiction on terms. <laughs> she, you know, she went to Wellesley, you know that, man. They have dinner together, they the girls, you know, and they sing America after dinner. And they sing, and crown thy good with sisterhood. <laughs> yeah, they're all the way, you know. And, uh, and then Madeleine Albright, who was at the State Department before her, is Wellesley. And Woody's kid, the one that you all say looks like Frank Sinatra, <laughs> he was at the State Department uh, working for Hillary. And, and uh, who really was trying to get Pakistan. That's really what that was all about, with Richard Holbrook and Holcroft. Yeah, Woody's kid is a neocon. Is that unbelievable? <laughs> I mean, you talk about retribution. <laughs> you know what? Tennessee Williams said, the God that made this country must have been deaf, dumb, and blind. <laughs> and he also said, 
And of all the sins men commit, the worst is deliberate cruelty. Not bad, huh? Uh, Tennessee Williams was homosexual, as most of us who are talented are. We can't come out because we lose work. Yeah, I'll tell you, I was out with Gene McCarthy when he ran against Johnson. And the head of the gay community in West Hollywood, which is almost a redundancy, uh, David Mixer, he said, you know, I hope you don't think we're inferior. Because we're not. So McCarthy said, okay. And Mixer said, well, why don't you ever say it in public? That we're not inferior. Sitting with McCarthy went to his car and he rolled the window down and he said, David, makes turn around. McCarthy said, no, neither are we. <laughs> so not bad, huh? I can tell by your lack of response. <laughs> uh, uh, it's wonderful, I must tell you, love of your fellow man. Uh, but I still have expectations of women. You understand? <laughs> that, you know. I'm fearless. I've been married three times, and not casually. <laughs> and I really, I was married 25 years the first time. 25 years. And uh, I found women to be beautiful on the surface, but unforgiving underneath. <laughs> That's my own evaluation. <laughs> and uh, I'm someone who would be 40 now if you'd gotten through this, but he didn't. And uh, he went to Santa Monica High School. And the teacher looked at the seating chart and she said, is your father that guy that keeps talking about Kennedy? Uh, he said, yeah. She said, well, tell your father when you go home that I don't believe in conspiracy. What do you think of that? And my son said, I think that's why they got away with it. <laughs> 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 So you know we're streaming tonight, thanks to the, the efforts of uh, Chris Britt, the producer, and, and Kathleen, who is the godmother of all of us. And, and she, uh, she's our good luck. And you know, we've been everywhere. Last week we heard from Saudi Arabia and Brazil. You know about Saudi Arabia having open rebellion, you know, uh, one woman wore pants, the other one drove a car. So they're trying to figure out, I mean, the last shit that equates to it. We were free here, though. That's why they're so happy. Uh, <laughs> according to Hillary and, and Elizabeth Warren, they're not happy. Uh, I can't believe it. You know, I can't, really can't believe the country. It, it's so... Uh, did any of you see the movie JFK about the assessment? You know... That scene with Kevin Costner and Donald Sutherland, where he plays Fletcher Prouty, he tells Garrison who did it. That was me. I went to meet Pr uh, Prouty, not Garrison. I went there and met him. And uh, Oliver Stone is a different kind of fake. He's almost real, you know. He just gets you in the details, but. Uh, I continue to talk about the Kennedy assassination. People said, well, you can't talk about it, you don't make it funny. So they made it funny, and they still didn't want me to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, the president, you know, was a Roman Catholic, the first president, Roman Catholic. And he thought it would do him in. And then I got hired over there to do the shows, to take people's mind off him. So I got hired by his father. When he got the nomination, which he got by a sliver, he got off the plane and uh, a reporter said, did your father get to the governors and by the favorite son delegations to get you nominated? So he's a very cagey county. He said, where did you hear that? And that reporter said, well, we didn't exactly hear it, but we mentioned it to the governor of North Carolina, and he, he kind of, you know, he, he said, uh, we mentioned to this guy in your office, and he kind of smiled. It works in your father's office. 
And Kennedy said, now I know you're lying because nobody who worked for my father ever smiled. <laughs> Good joke. So the old man was murdered. Yeah, he was murdered. Ironic because his son wasn't. And uh, he, the greatest speech he ever made was at American University when he said, just the word death. He says, uh, we have that peace not keep rebuilding a Pentagon every two years. He said, because the Russians and I, and we, uh, uh, both breathe the same air. We all treasure a future for our children, and we are all mortal. Great speech. So he was better than he thought he was once he got in there. When he first got in, you know, there was a black kid trying to get to the University of Mississippi. And the governor came down there and said, no, not coming in here. And the National Guard out there. Segregation then, segregation now, segregation forever. So he was in the office with Bobby. And he said, what do we do? And Bobby had his assistant, Nicholas Katzenbach, standing there saying, this is the Constitution. You have to let them in. I don't have to do anything. So uh, Jack said, why don't I call the National Guard into the Army, and then they'll have to listen to my command and let those kids in. So while Bobby was weighing the constitutionality of all that, Kasselbeck said to the National Guardsmen, you're federalized. So they all dropped their rifles. You know, they said, does this mean we can't have children? <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and Jane and Meredith got into the school. All of that seemed important at the time, but it's the kind of stuff that CNN wouldn't cover now. All their correspondents are CIA people, you know. Uh, why was Turkey attacked, Jake? Well. I just talked to Anderson Cooper and Don Lemon. And, uh, it's their feeling that uh, there's a heavy ISIS cell in Istanbul. Uh, hard to believe. Uh, hard to believe what happened. You remember Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow, John Hart? It's my friend, you know. John Hart was the anchor of the CBS Morning News. And then he moved over to NBC. And uh, then he and I worked at the Christian Science Monitor. Some of that is on YouTube, you want to see it. There's like nine shows up there. And uh, anyway, Hart and I were talking with him. He's a great friend of mine. And he said to me, you're, uh, I said, you know, John, nobody's going to live up to our expectations. You gotta forgive people. And he said to me, oh my God, you're a Christian. <laughs> so I said to lessen his pain, oh, you're a liberal, <laughs> but because I'm a Christian, I'll forgive you. <laughs> you believe in forgiveness? Yeah, you can, you can use it, you can wield it. That's a good thing about forgiveness. Otherwise it gets green and moldy in the back of the car if you don't forgive people. And uh, I seem to remember an old joke in Los Angeles about the Pope sending Mother Teresa to Los Angeles to reform everybody morally. <laughs> and people find out she's on duty and they call her and don't get her, they get her service. And uh, the messenger on the phone says, this is Terry, I'm out now. At my exercise class, I'm going to get a latte and I'll be back later. <laughs> Don't find it humorous, huh? <laughs> well, it's okay. You'd have to be a Catholic to understand that joke. Although you don't have to be a Catholic to use the services of the Pope, because he's always around. You notice that? He's always dropping in on people who are just in Armenia, forgiving them for being Armenians or whatever they do. <laughs> so, <laughs> Right, Tony? So, okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, this isn't just my show, it's the people's show. Much like the Clinton administration will be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
when do you think, well, that's kind of in bad taste, so I'll say it. <laughs> he doesn't look around for a lot of girls. They don't have anything to do with each other. I had a dream the other night that they reconciled to give her luck in the election. And it's better than ever because of forgiveness. <laughs> They rolled opposite set ends of the bed. And he says, that was fabulous. She says, yes, it was. And, and he says, who were you thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know you don't expect that from me. You know, but you expect good taste from me. You know, Throw my body on the barbed wire. Uh, <laughs> for the good of the cause. It's all unbelievable, you know. That whole thing with Kennedy, I carried that along all the way through the Garrison trial of Clay Shaw. And Garrison said to me, really unhappy when Shaw got acquitted, he said to me, do you think the American people want to know the truth? I said, yes, they have a deep hunger for it. And he said, the American people are like uh, Hamlet. He comes up there and he says, somebody's killed my father and somebody's got to pay. He said, hey, that's my guy. You know? And three hours later, you're in the theater, wilted, and he's saying, somebody killed my father. I said, I know. And they got to pay. Yeah, you said that before. <laughs> so uh, Hamlet was one last night with uh, Lawrence Olivier. And uh, speaking of Lawrence Olivier, I knew him. And he told me Richard Burton would have been a superb classical actor if he hadn't met Elizabeth Taylor. He got distracted. And, uh, Burton wound up making a movie with Clint Eastwood called Where Eagles Dare. Yes. And I said to him, what do you think of Clint's acting? And Burton said to me, it's a unique style. I would call it a dynamic lethargy. <laughs> <laughs> See, they unburdened me because I think all the risk is on my side. You have to understand it psychologically. And if you had a good doctor, you, uh, you would. But uh, I don't know if there are any good ones left, you know. You know, there's a Dr. Grojan here in Mill Valley, and I knew his father in Beverly Hills because Warren Beatty went to him, and uh, Joey Mitchell, and Diane Keaton, and Bob Town. And whenever Beatty met somebody, uh, he would take them to his doctor for group therapy. So Dr. Grotjohn called me one day and he said to me, you don't know me. I said, I know of you though. I know all the stars that go through that door. He said, well, that's confidential. I said, okay. And he said to me, I'm writing a book on humor. I wonder if you can help me. I said, you want just the guy. I sit and tell jokes to people for hours. And I don't laugh, and I don't give up. <laughs> I'm a fanatic. And he said to me, uh, I said, what's the emphasis of the book? He said, the fact that the Jewish people prevail over all human. I said, you're kidding, aren't you? He said, no, man. They got a lock on the Jewish people. And he and I had this terrible argument on the phone. I said, they're awful. The old ones were awful, and the new ones are worse. And he said, no, no, no. And I said, where would a guy like you get that idea? Then it hit me. And I said, are you Gentile? He said, yes, I'm German. I said, so the Jewish people have fooled another guy. <laughs> and he didn't laugh. So I know he wasn't Jewish. But most of the good doctors were Jewish. Uh, Freud being the originator of all of it. And uh, boy, was he good. This patient says to him, I'm going to have a baby and I'm not married. Who can I tell? He says, tell your mother. She said, my mother? My mother would go ballistic. That's the way she talked when she was in the <laughs> <laughs> And Freud says, no, your mother will understand. That's what mothers are for. Not good? Great writing. <laughs> oh, uh, the movie about Freud, by the way, was Montgomery Clift as Freud. And Larry Parks, who played Jolson as Brewer, using hypnosis in Vienna, 
Catholic Vienna. And uh, Freud gets up one day there at the Medical Society and he says, I have something to tell you. I've been hypnotizing people and I've verified there's an unconscious and we're going to start with psychoanalysis. And uh, a lot of the doctors walked out, Catholic also, spit on the floor next to him. And he stood there and he said, what you deny here, you'll dream about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good. <laughs> and uh, the great, you'll find that I don't want to appear to be racially prejudiced, but for the size of the Jewish people, the contribution is really outsized. I mean, look at the great Jewish people, Einstein, Freud, Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when he came here and talked to Congress about attacking Iran? Then he finished his speech and he said, I want to thank Sheldon Adelson for the use of his fall. <laughs> <laughs> Sheldon Adelson owns everything in Vegas where I used to work. You know, I worked at the Hilton for three years with Elvis Presley. And he was a nice guy, a really good guy. And in fact, Smokey Moore, the guitar player, died two nights ago. 84, worked with Elvis. And Elvis said to me one day, he had these kind of insights. He said to me, you worked with jazz a lot? I said, yeah, Captain Ellington, basically. He said to me, there's more drugs on the gospel bus than there is on jazz bus. Not <laughs> <laughs> bad. So uh, you can learn if, you, if your mind is open. And, uh, so before we take our questions tonight, uh, let me point out to you the Jewish contribution. The Jews are 4% of the population. They have 42% of the Nobel Prizes. The first great Jewish contribution to Western thought is from Moses, who invented the law. Remember Moses? You know? The tablets, take the tablets and call me in the morning. <laughs> Moses, and nobody wanted to obey the law, but he did come up with it. Uh, and after him, the next great Jewish thinker was Jesus, who said, if people break the law blatantly in front of you, try to forgive them. And nobody accepted that idea either, forgiving them. The next great Jewish thinker is probably uh, Karl Marx, who said that, uh, even if you steal from people, if you can share what you steal, <laughs> socially. Uh, uh, like, no, I work too hard stealing this. I'm not going to give any of it back. That failed. And then Freud came along and said, if you can't obey the law and you can't forgive and you can't share, maybe you can understand people. You know, no, I don't understand anybody. I'm too busy spending what they stole from them. So uh, then the last great Jewish thinkers were uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer and Einstein who came up with the atomic bomb and they called Roosevelt and they said, we've come up with a weapon that uh, can destroy everything we've built until now. And they said, uh, that went over me. <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> and, and then they started building centrifuges. So, uh, so if you all think about it. any questions, Chris? Anybody? Yeah, we have a question from uh, Periscope. They were wondering if you watched the speech by Nigel Farage, Farage, uh, <laughs> to the to the Parliament. Yeah, and uh, I think this is an excellent example: the British voting to leave that, and all the American, the President Obama, uh, they can't do that. In other words, people can't govern themselves. That's what we've come to with Obama. After eight years, droning six times as many people as Bush did, and still being in Afghanistan, and his term ending in four months, he said that the British people, you know, are out of their gourd. They don't know what they do. And it really, it really is binding. So, uh, and his, his theoretical replacement, Hillary, you know, when she was sworn in as Secretary of State, a block away from the State Department is the Council on Foreign Relations, which is engineered totally by David Rockefeller. 
And she said, it's comforting to know they're here. I can go talk to them whenever I need them, when she doesn't have a policy. Uh, do, you, do you know that group, the Council of Foreign Relations? Do you remember Rockefeller? Remember yeah. John D. Rockefeller? Rockefeller, at the height of amassing all that standard oil money, he used to go into Central Park in New York. Think of Central Park, you know, like 100 years ago. And if he saw a bum there and he talked to him and the guy wasn't drunk, he would give him a dime. A dime. <laughs> so uh, the way the story goes, Rockefeller dies and he arrives in heaven. And St. Peter says, there's a guy out there that was kind of ruthless. But it's a margin of case because he gave a dime to three guys that were hungry. <laughs> so God says, give them 30 cents and tell them to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Three guys arrived in heaven. St. Peter says, did you do anything in your life? I was a great school teacher. Come in. I was a great social worker. Come in. I was the head of an HMO. You can come in, but you can only stay overnight. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell jokes in my hand. If there's a gun in my hand. Yeah, what, what else? Anybody else, Chris? Uh, somebody just asked uh, if you could share some stories about your parents and were your parents funny? Yeah, you know, my parents uh, named Harry and Dorothy. Jones, I changed my name from Jones. Uh, my father met my mother the following way. She lived in Montreal. He put an ad in Poetry Magazine and said, is there still a woman out there who would like to meet a dreamer? And she took the train and came to Los Angeles. They got married in three days. And we were very poor. But not in humor, of course. Uh, I think to the end, my dad really believed in uh, good government. He really believed in He was disabled in France in World War I. And he got his pension. He, he liked the government a lot. Now, when I got famous, I took him to Washington. And I took him to the White House. And uh, I introduced him to President Johnson, whom he adored. I said to Johnson, you're destroying everything I've built up until now. Johnson was not long on humor, you know. I guess you ought to know everything about me, if you ask a person a question like that about my upbringing. Uh, I was with the Kennedys working for Jack Kennedy when Johnson was chosen. And uh, Jack and the old man decided that Johnson was a southerner and it would balance with an Ivy Leaguer. And Bobby went ballistic. He said, you're going to lose the black people, the Jews, the unions, the big cities. You're crazy. And the old man said, go down and tell Johnson he's a vice president. So he went down to Johnson's suite at the Billmore Hotel in LA. And he said, do you want to be vice president? And Johnson said, yes. And Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, was there. And he said, you're no longer a son of mine. And Johnson began to cry. You can't believe I saw Lyndon Johnson cry. And then, of course, Johnson, when he ran for re-election, named Humphrey. I remember this because a girl I was going out with, an actress, said to me, another female impersonator, she said, Humphrey can't be vice president. He doesn't look like a president. And I said, well, everybody can't be as handsome as Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carry on. <laughs> I tell you, I've had a very unlikely life. But if your mother loves you, you can do anything. Mm. Oh, yeah. Every time I sat across the dinner table with my good looking chick, I knew the affirmation was from my mother. As a matter of fact, I did that this week. <laughs> but don't tell her I said so. <laughs> so we have, a, we have another question uh, from Matt in uh, Flint, Michigan. Uh, Matt, who's been at the show, he said, um, what are the best ways to bring about social change for those who don't have a stage? 
who don't have uh, a stage or any power? I well, uh, the best way is to work with people that have some plasticity but aren't like you. If you get with people that are like you, you'll all agree and nothing will get done. It's like listening to Pacifica. You know? It's like listening at a radio station in Berkeley. You know, they're full of nobility. Well, I think if you're feeling that tense for it, I would eat some horseradish <laughs> and appeal to the vapors in your system. <laughs> well, I've already I already kicked gluten. It's gonna be a hard week. <laughs> Lactose reluctant. <laughs> It's uh, very narcissistic up here. And you know, I know, because I lived in the, in the other town. I lived in LA a long time, you know. I came from Los Angeles. I came up here because of a girl whom I married, who won't talk to me. Mm. I tell you, boy, they really hold a grudge. <laughs> what do you mean by they? Uh, ex wives. Uh, mostly. <laughs> oh, three. Mm. So I believe in love. It's the one thing I believe in. I believe in love in the movies, and I can't produce the movies. There aren't any. You go by the sequoia, it doesn't look like a, a cemetery. It not, nothing, it's never a movie there, except when Woody makes it a movie. So, yes. so we have a lot of questions about tr Trump. We have a lot of statements and questions about Trump. Are you voting for Trump? What do you think about Trump? Trump 2016, do you have anything to share about Donald Trump? Well, he, uh, he made a fortune, so that means Hillary probably secretly admired him. <laughs> she seemed to me to be excessively materialistic. And uh, Goldman Sachs is right there behind her. And Kasich, the governor of Ohio, who is still running quietly, is, uh, you know, he worked for Lehman Brothers for nine years. Those are the guys that ripped the world off, you know? And uh, Wall Street, and then of course, uh, we went to war, which will never end. I gather it's a spiral we're in. And uh, because they attacked our financial institution <coughs> in the Twin Towers, although you can't read the report. <laughs> so uh, the liberals want to feel better about themselves, so they're against Trump. They're very good at mobilizing against somebody. But they can't bring themselves to really say anything good about her. You don't really believe she'll change the status of women. We change the status of women because we love them. Now, you know, that guy that's in jail now, Bradley Manning, for telling the truth, gave it to WikiLeaks. You know that, he's a, a specialist first class in the army. And he's taking hormones to become a woman. And once he becomes a woman, the army is going to cut his pay. <laughs> so, I know them all. You know, I knew Gloria Steinem very well. She went out with my friend Herb Sargent, who was the story editor at uh, Saturday Night Live, and also wrote the Steve Allen show. And uh, Hillary impaneled a jury in Eastern Virginia against Assange, if he ever comes out of the Ecuadorian embassy. And you want to know what a woman is? An example of a woman? Look at Assange's mother when she flies to Ecuador and says to the president, will you give my son refuge? She's a real man. I mean, the real McCoy. And if your mother loved you, nothing can stop you. Boulevard stops, nothing. Can't stop you. Insurance companies, nothing can stop. <laughs> but the liberals, you know, they really resist change. That's why they're not liberals. They're only posing as liberals. You know, uh, they hate change. Boy, they, you know, Bill Clinton to Hillary Clinton. He wasn't that great, if you recall. And uh, his conversation with Vernon Jordan. Here's a guy who went through the Civil Rights Revolution in Vernon Jordan and became an expensive Washington lawyer. And Bill Clinton came out of Arkansas and became the president for two terms. And they're talking about women in the grossest possible terms. 
And then, of course, that Lewinsky story wouldn't have broken except for Drudge, the Drudge Report printed. The liberals were suppressing it. And uh, you know what the joke was, man? When she gave the details of their relationship, somebody said, uh, any guy that can get a Jewish girl to do that for him <laughs> deserves to be president. <laughs> I didn't know. That's too well rounded for me. I'm busy propagandizing. <laughs> I'm just a misguided romantic. And boy, if I'm misguided on several occasions. I came up here, you know, originally I, I drove my girlfriend in LA to Berkeley. She was at UCLA. I drove her up here, and then I drive them back. I drove them back that late over late because my car boiled over on crawling into Bakersfield. And I'm what, 36 Ford 3 went over. And when we got down and the parents were waiting, you know, we were all landed gentry in West Los Angeles. Why are you late? He <laughs> said, well, Ford's car boiled over and everything. And we left Berkeley at late. And I remember this one girl's mother said, Berkeley, Berkeley. I never want to see the name, hear the name Berkeley again. And they put her into their car. She still lives here, Mill Valley. And, uh, Ricky. And, and they were rolling up the windows, and she was leaning out the window again, like, Berkeley, Berkeley, Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those were good days. You know, everybody, a lot of promise, man. I had not started the hungry eye yet. I was like yelling about you, you know, telling everybody the audience is intelligent. No, they're not. They want joke to my men. They said, no, I'm a lawyer and I represent the audience. Mm -hmm. And they're intelligent. And I, I believed it. And you have to be a missionary, you know, whether you got Stan Kenton's orchestra or your Clarence Darrell defending a Scottsboro Boys, you have to really, you know, uh, Clarence Darrow said the greatest word in the English language is justice. And he got those guys off, by the way. But, you know, I don't think it's enough to get a black guy off when he's in court. I think you've got to guarantee him a show at CNN. <laughs> You're the best audience we've had here in a long time. And I have no expectation tonight uh, because of the holiday we're going to be. Uh, Celebrating the exit from the EU. <laughs> well, it's a great soap you got, Chris. Yeah, we're uh, trying to get a little bit more mobile tonight. Should we take a question from the audience here in the room? Sure. Okay. We're fearless. Uh, here we go. So who, who killed Jack Kennedy? <laughs> who killed Jack Kennedy? Yeah. The CIA killed Jack Kennedy because he would not get out of Vietnam. And I said that publicly before, and it's no secret. And if you care to know more about it, uh, read Garrison's book on the trail of the assassins. I was an investigator in his office, you know, with a badge and a desk and everything. And, uh, and also, uh, read The Secret Team by Fletcher Prouty, Colonel Fletcher Prouty. Yes, he backfired. They thought they hired a fascist, and he double-crossed them. And they were furious at him. And the CIA is still running this country. And by the way, this week on C-SPAN, they played the church committee hearings 40 years ago. General Lewis Allen, head of the National Security Agency, and Frank Church said, you're tapping people's phones? That's constitutionally prohibited. He said, the Constitution doesn't apply to us. And you know, they... The CIA tried to kill Castro 636 times, uh, and he's still there. <laughs> the CIA is in Brazil, that's why the president was impeached, and it's in Venezuela. They think they're running Latin America. How many, how many people? And they have a lot of distractions, like uh, Barack Obama is supposed to be different. You notice he doesn't replace Brennan. She wouldn't either. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so we'll take one more question. I might repeat it. Could you speak? Uh, you're in the back. We don't. We're not mics in the back. Could you just say your question very succinctly? Yeah. How many people were taking a shot at Kennedy? Because I, I shoot at a rifle once in a while, and that was a hell of a shot for one guy to take. If, you know. His how many shooters were there? Yeah. How many shooters were there? Well, there were guys behind the grassy knoll. I ran that film on my show on Channel 11 in Los Angeles. You can see them. Uh, the photographic work was done by a guy named Bob Groden in Philadelphia. Uh, the way we got into the case is that we follow Oswald, and Garrison said to me, why does everybody we find work for the federal government? <laughs> so Oswald was a, uh, a setup to distract everybody. And the shooters, it was a very clean job. It's not how you get to a president, it's you remove protection. For instance, the car, the Secret Service is instructed never to go below 44. They're doing 11 miles an hour when Jack Kennedy is hit. And when they get to Parkland Hospital, what's the first thing they do? They take a hose and hose out the inside of the car. Then Johnson says, I'm going to be president, and removes the body. And they patch up the autopsy back in Bethesda. You can't remove a body in a murder in any city in what, the United States. So uh, they take off, and uh, uh, the killers were probably not Americans. They were recruited from all over the world. That's what they do. I mean, compare this. De Gaulle says, I'm freeing Algeria. I'm going to go to this square and do it. And the airborne generals, the paratroopers say, if he shows his head, we'll kill him. He gets out of the, uh, the uh, uh, citron and stands there and says, I'm freeing Algeria. Nobody shoots because of the presidential guard. There's a presidential guard around the King of Jordan now who might say he wants Assad to stay or go or whatever. But Kennedy had 600 guys at Fort Hood, presidential protection detail. They were told to stand down by Washington. And then, of course, to investigate his murder, they put a commission together, and the head of the CIA is on the commission, uh, Mr. Dulles. So uh, it's unbelievable. I don't know who could stop them. I don't think anybody running for office now could stop them. Or wants to. Or wants to. In other words, why doesn't Diane Feinstein condemn them? She's out of the intelligence committee. <laughs> and Barbara Boxer quit. And the DA they're running here has got a rate of 80% acquittals. <laughs> Garrison had about 95% convictions. But he was a simple guy. We flew the Confederate flag. <laughs> And we took Jefferson Davis's birthday off. And all the people that he knew worked in coal mines in West Virginia. But he believed in Jack Kennedy. The only guy in that case that knew Kennedy was me. The rest of them were taking my word for it. <laughs> and then Shaw got off because he perjured himself. And uh, Oswald was a distraction. But thank you for asking. We have another question. Just another uh, question about North Beach comedy in the 60s, especially if you ever saw the, uh, the committee, the seen the show. Yes. The, the question is about comedy in North Beach, San Francisco in the 60s, and if you had ever seen the committee. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Myerson uh, was running the committee up there when we were in a hungry eye. And uh, I was very familiar with Second City in Chicago as well. Work back there, Mr. Kelly's, and the Compass Players. And out of that came uh, Second City, Al Arkin. And up here, uh, the committee, I knew Gary Goodrow. I knew a lot of those guys. And uh, they were good. You know, they had real native sense of, of comedy and tragedy, which stand up comedians don't have. They were, I mean, today they're all, you know, shucking and jiving. If you come in and find somebody funny on Tuesday, it's because your, your luck is running good. Uh, but they don't want to change the world. 
That's the thing that happened. They don't want to change the world as they know it. Yet they want to change the world. Just like when a girl marries us, she wants to change us. Uh, you remember that? Marriage? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we, we have another question in the room here. Uh, hey, Mort, what's up? Uh, have you heard of an old Borstel comedian named Maury Amsterdam? That is the question is, 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 we have a, we have a relative of Maury Amsterdam in the audience. Did, did you know Maury Amsterdam? Yes, I did. And uh, I'll tell you a story about Maury Amsterdam, now that you ask me. Uh, I was working in Boston. And uh, I was working at a club called Lenny's on the Turnpike with the Buddy Rich Band. And uh, the band broke to go to the bar, and Buddy walked over and he said to the first trumpet player, the trumpet section is ragged. Do you have any suggestions? So the guy said, trumpet lessons? <laughs> and Buddy said, they're fired. What do you God walks up and said, I'm the nightclub critic for the Boston Globe, George Frazier. And I have to review Maury Amsterdam tonight. Uh, can you go with me? I said, sure. So I finished the set, and I go with him. And we go to a part of Boston called the Combat Zone, where these clubs are. And they're all owned by the mafia. So I look at the sign says, Maury Amsterdam and Bobby Breen. So I look out in the audience, there's two people there. And I met them, and they said, we're Bobby Breen's niece and nephew. <laughs> <laughs> so George Frazier said to me, i got to make the Bulldog editions, so I'm going to go back to the paper. You stay here. So now there's three of us on the clock. They said, ladies and gentlemen, the singing star of our show, Bobby Breen. So he comes out, and he sings, and when he finishes, his niece and nephew leave. <laughs> so they leave. Oh, and he's got one of the comedy star of our show, Maury Amsterdam. And he walked out and he saw me there and he said, if I find the guy who put the yellow fever sign on this club. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, of course, when he did the Van Dyke show, where they had a lot of fun. <laughs> Van Dyke was a good guy. Still smoke. <laughs> He's like 90 so Still smoke. Chris, good guy. Yeah, it really, you were really great to me. I don't know how I did, but you, you were through. <laughs> you were it really feels like. <laughs> God, God bless Lucy for keeping it going. You know, she believes, no matter what the evidence is. And uh, we're going to start a movie series in the theater. And I don't know what night she's going to shoot. We're going we're to show six great movies. I can tell you a little bit about them. Uh, 12 O'Clock High, The Bridge in Order of Hawaii, Ryan's Bar. We're going to show them in the mezzanine. And I'll introduce them and add whatever notes I have on the <laughs> making of uh, these pictures, and uh, I was lucky enough to know some of those guys, Lee Marvin, and Steve McQueen, and uh, I should mention before I go to them, in The Professionals, the last line in the picture is the best last line I've ever heard in a movie. Uh, they're hired by Ralph Bellamy to bring his wife back, and she isn't kidnapped, she loves somebody else, so they don't bring her back. And Ralph Bellamy said, you bastard, to Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin said, yes, sir. In my case, an accident of work. But you, sir, you're a self-made man. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.